What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Above and Below, a Salt Life podcast. I am your host, Kieran Anderson, and today we have Captain Hunter Bolton on with us. Hunter, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Fantastic. Thank you. Um, dude, I've never talked to you. Uh, my first time ever getting introduced to you is online. It's so funny how this works. The podcast is so funny to me. But uh, give us a little overview on yourself. I want to know about you, what you do, where you're from. Uh, yeah, give us the rundown. So I'm a uh, full-time charter captain in Beaufort, North Carolina, or really Atlantic Beach, North Carolina. I work out of Chase and Tails Outdoors, um, and then I do inshore and nearshore fishing um, full-time, and uh, that's kind of the gist of it. Epic. Dude, we got to get all into that stuff, inshore and nearshore, because I just consider it offshore fishing here when I'm past like 10 miles, you know, I'm living in California, so it's a bit different from uh, what you guys have over there, especially for the fish, ha- fish hatchery and everything. But uh, so you're a charter captain, and that's what you do by trade. Uh, how long have you been doing that? Uh, I've been charter fishing only for a few years. Um, I was a freshwater fishing guide before that, did a lot of uh, trout stuff, uh, lived in Colorado for a while, Western North Carolina. Now I'm here full time. Oh, rad. How, what made you move? Like going from Colorado to North Carolina, I feel like that's a pretty significant move there. Uh, well, I'm from North Carolina originally. And okay. Grew up saltwater fishing, and I was uh, there was a point in time where I was spending seasonal time fishing the saltwater, and then fishing in the summers for trout, and uh, just kind of started to enjoy the saltwater more and more, and decided to just make the move and go all in. How much of a difference is it going from saltwater fishing and chartering now saltwater fishing compared to maybe going to like Colorado and and fishing for trout and steelhead and stuff like that? Like, I feel like there's such a difference between freshwater fishing and saltwater fishing that people don't recognize. It's crazy. There's a lot more decisions to make with saltwater fishing. There's a lot more things that can go wrong. It's just you're working with a lot more. It's easier to make a mistake. It's easier to go to the wrong place. So You really got to have your ducks in a row, but a lot of it's the same, you know, creating conversation with people, you're making sure it's fun no matter what. Um, and just trying to get out there, catch fish, enjoy the day. So so it's all, I guess, pretty similar. I know that is true. Talking to people and having a good time, right? That's what fishing's all about. But, um, what have you been up to? Have you been fishing a bunch? Yeah. Just out there getting sunburned, trying to catch a few fish when I can. I love it. That's so good. So, so how does the company work? Do you guys have multiple boats that you're chartering out there? Yeah, so there's, a, there's four of us that run full-time out of Chase and Tails, and then there's some other guys that fill in for us. Um, but during the summer months, you know, there's several boats going out every day. Uh, it's a great group of guys, and it's, just, it's nice to um, kind of feel like you're part of a team instead of just being alone. You know, you can always pick up the phone. We work with each other well. Um, yeah. So, there's some big advantages to working with an outfit like them. How did you get introduced to uh, Chasing Tails? In, in this area, I was originally chartering for my own company a little bit and ended up meshing well with them, and they used me for a few charters, and then um, it progressed from there, and it, it turned into a full-time role. That's crazy. It's funny. I feel like word of mouth and just communication with communication with like other people around you, that's literally what you need to do if you want to find something to do find a job go find fishing spots just go talk to people socializing is the best thing in the world right that's right i love it it's so good so um talk to me about your team then are you super close with everybody that you work with yep pretty close i mean i'm working with the same guys every day um captain nick nance is kind of our head guy there he's been there for years and years and he's such a good guy to work with and kind of took me under his wing in a way. So having somebody with all that experience that's uh, willing to work with you and help you out is definitely led to a lot of my success. Yeah. That's amazing. That's good. It's good to have like, you know, those role models or, or influences in your life that are such a step ahead of you that you can look up to and get encouraged by, and they don't treat you in a way that it's it's scary. It's more of like they want to bring you in and expand your knowledge and ability to become a better charter captain or a better fisherman or whatever you want to do. But that's that's what's cool about um, you know companies like that, right? Like Chase and Tail. That's super cool to hear that. And and the amazing thing is that you want to 
go work with these guys every single day too. That's right. Yeah, I feel like a lot of guys get jaded and their their attitude gets rough as they've been in the industry for a long time. And uh, so working with guys that have a great attitude and are willing to help and want to see you succeed is I'd be lying if I if I said that it didn't help me in a big way. Oh, absolutely. So, uh, Hunter, where exactly is Chasing Tails ran out of? So Chasing Tails is on the Atlantic Beach Causeway when you head into Atlantic Beach from Moorhead City. Big tackle shop on the right, and uh, it's it's right on the water too. So uh, we're able to run these charters right out of the back of the shop. Wow. Um, and then, you know, we have water access, so we've got all the live baits that a lot of tackle shops can't carry or keep alive because we're able to, you know, host that bait right on the water, pump it, pump water yeah. out of the canal, keep everything alive. Um, so it's a great location to get bait and your tackle as well. How long has the company been around for? It must have been nine or 10 years ago, the first time I shopped and bought some bait and tackle from them. You know, that's what the company's all about. You want to have your clientele come to the, come to fish and just have the best time of their life, right? Like, right. That, that's what it's all about. And it's so, so rad to, to see that just growing that way. But, um, so talk to me about, you were talking about inshore fishing, near shore fishing and that whole nine yards. What is the biggest difference between near shore and offshore? Because I am from the West Coast, and I have no idea what you're talking about when you say near shore. It's so funny to me. I hear that all the time, and I'm like, near shore? What the heck? Is that just like past the break, or what is that? So for us, uh, basically in the state of North Carolina, it's determined as uh, within three miles of the coastline. Oh, wow. And that that has to do with permits and other things, but um, basically I'm allowed to fish uh, from the from the inlet out to a, the three mile mark. Got it. And so, are there specific regulations on fish and everything? Is there like a, a season for fish for near shore and a season for fish for offshore and stuff like that, or vice versa? Not necessarily. I mean, there are fish that may be in the near shore waters at a certain point in the year that would be deeper in other points of the year that would be considered to be more offshore. But uh, no, not necessarily. The The biggest difference is just the uh, the offshore guys. They pull different permits and things like that. And I do so much inshore fishing myself that it's not worth it to um, expand and do that when I'm so much of my time is consumed in the backwaters and then periodically popping out of the beachfront and fishing along the beach and as some close wrecks and things like that. What kind of fish are you primarily going for near shore? Near shore, uh, tons of Spanish mackerel, some king mackerel, Atlantic bonitas, uh, false albies, cobia, bull reds. Uh, so there's a number of different things we catch, sometimes even groupers, uh, black sea bass. So uh, we're lucky to live in an area here where we get deep fairly quickly um so just pretty much a mile off the beach you're already in 50 foot of water so at least yeah. the door open for a lot of species to be close by compared to somewhere where you know you're gradually gaining depth as you get off and you may only be in 30 feet of water a couple miles off the beach and just getting a foot at a time we have a quick drop here what kind of boats are you guys running uh, i run a 24 uh, foot bay boat and then I've also got a uh, 23 foot Maycraft Cape Classic, which is more like a, uh, I consider it to be more of like a near shore or bigger water boat. It's got taller gunnels, uh, manages the rougher swells a little bit better. Got it. And then um, as far as like near shore fishing and stuff like that, I know like you're saying it's, it's up to three miles out. So when you're inshore fishing as well, is that considered near shore fishing on So inshore is anything I consider I consider near shore or uh, inshore fishing to be anything behind the beach. So rivers, even the inlet, marshes, uh intercoastal waterway, things like that. That is so interesting. It's such a, a different way of fishing than I do over here. Like if I'm going offshore, I'm going like taking my jet ski or the boat out like 15, 20 miles and get bluefin tuna, you know, like that's right. offshore. If I'm a mile off the beach, I'm like, oh yeah, I was offshore on patties, you know, like that's offshore to me. And then inshore fishing in California is literally fishing from the beach, you know, right. in Corbina and halibut, whatever. So it's just, it's interesting. It's fun to talk about that kind of stuff because it's, 
there's so many differences, right? In uh, East Coast versus West Coast and Southern states. You guys, like you guys don't have the, the backwaters and the marshes and things like that. It's totally different. So, so what we have is we have lagoons and stuff, but there's not really a bunch of saltwater fish in there. It's more brackish water. And those, the fish that are in there, it, it's like the jetties. Like there's a wave called Pono jetties around me that I surf all the time. And halibut come into the lagoon over there and they hang out in the sandbar in there. So there's really good halibut fishing in there. But that's more just, we just call it, hey, we're going to go fish Pono jetties or Pono lagoon, you know? Like we right. don't say, oh, we're going to inshore fishing. Because I've seen a lot of videos in YouTube and stuff of guys going spear fishing inshore in marshes and stuff for like whatever, like crazy fish. And I'm like, what the heck? That's crazy that you guys are doing that on the East Coast. Yeah, our, our marshes and backwaters are pretty loaded up with different fish here. Yeah. And I probably do more inshore fishing than nearshore fishing. I mean, it's it's pretty close, but it's not quite 50-50. I probably spend more time inside than out along the beach. Well, I feel like maybe that might be good for a company too because you have the opportunity to be like, hey, the weather outside's bad. You know, the weather outside the breaks, it's windy, but then you go inshore and it's nice and calm. Yeah, we don't have to cancel hardly any charters because of that. So we're able to get our customers out in almost any conditions. I mean, there's some some days where it's just not worth it, but basically 99% of the time you can do something. Hey, I got a good question for you from the uh, audience questions here. You guys have trolling motors on your boat? We do. I heard that uh, a motor went bad, but you guys were still able to crush some redfish. Yeah, I got lucky. That could have ended a lot worse. Uh, but yeah, we, we got out to fish for the day, threw the trolling motor out, went to cut it on, and absolutely nothing. Um, so I ended up I ended up having like a uh, a major corrosion problem inside of the plug. And uh, the day before, like I had, there was no indication it was going to fail, and then it just did done. So, but I learned a valuable lesson for that because I changed the type of plug that I use. And uh, now, you know, I've been looking in there with a flashlight because I'm nervous about it and nothing. <laughs> I'm good to go now. Life lesson. So tell me, how did you guys end up fishing that day? Like if you don't have a trolling motor, were you, you were inshore? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Well, how did you guys get it done? I've got power poles on my boat, the shallow water anchors. And yeah. I looked out because the first spot I went to had fish and most days it doesn't. I have to bounce around and find them. But so we, you know, I got to the first spot, realized the trolling motor didn't work, put the power poles down and I just lucked out and didn't have to move. They were right there. Were your clients like, what the heck is going on? Or did you kind of just play it off? Like, okay, we're good. Uh, I mean, I explained that it was an issue. Yeah. But once we started catching fish, it was like, you know, oh, well. That is so sick, dude. I love this. So it, what, it, that'll never happen again that way. If it ever broke again, there'd be no fish anywhere around. Dude, so talk to me about what the clients wanted to go for. Like, was there a specific fish? Were you guys going for redfish? Was that like the, the journey of the day? This was the uh, the salt life trip and that it broke on, and we okay. were going to target redfish. Um, that's oh, no like, way. Yeah. Dude, that's so classic. It was, it was during the shoot, so... We were we were specifically gonna go target redfish. That's kind of a staple here in the summertime is red drum fishing. I mean it's big in eastern North Carolina. So that's what that's what the plan was. That's what we were going to do. And uh luckily they were just right there where I pulled up and we were able to catch a good amount of them without having to move. We were probably out for three or four hours, but we fished for maybe two, two and a half. Um the tide got to a certain point where I knew they were gone from that area. Yeah. And so we kind of went to ride around, see if anything else was going on. But at that point, I mean, we had caught a good amount of redfish and it wasn't a big problem. So we went for a boat ride and called it good. So how big are uh, the redfish getting over there? We catch them um, uh, from anywhere from being juvenile fish that might be a foot long all the way up to, um, you know, 50 plus inches. Uh, wow. This area is known for holding some, the biggest redfish in the world. Wow. Um, and we don't, that's not really a, a an early summer yeah. um, target. And we start going for those trophy fish really, really starting now, but August and September is when we target what we call the bull drum or 
or here we in Eastern North Carolina, they call them old drum, but they're, you know, the, the sexually mature reproducing drum that are, uh, citation sized. So specifically with that <clears throat> salt life charter that you guys did, uh, what was the biggest redfish you guys got? Um, we caught a few that were over the, uh, slot limit. So legally too big to keep. And I think maybe in the 30 inch range. Gnarly. So those are actually my favorite size fish to catch. I enjoy the the old drum, the really big ones, but I like the upper slot, which are the uh, fish that are big, but still legal to keep. And the ones just above that, that are just over keeping size. So when you're, when you're going for redfish and stuff, talk to me about your tackle. Like, what did you guys have on that trip? Were you specifically inshore? And when you go inshore, are you specifically only bringing tackle for inshore? Uh, usually I've got all kinds of stuff in my bay boat because I don't know what the day is going to bring. Half the time I think I'm doing one thing and I end up doing something totally different. So I've got stuff that's in the boat ready to fish the ocean as well as my backwater tackle just loaded down. Um, but redfish tackle is pretty simple. Uh, in the summertime, we're fishing uh, marsh flats, basically a foot to two foot of water. And you're uh, fishing a lot of popping corks, which is just essentially a, uh, a cork that makes noise. You can pop it. Um, then it can draw a fish in to look at it. it they'll hear it and come in. Um, and then you're running just a short leader under that with either live bait and artificial or, or maybe even some dead cut bait. Did the girls get a couple fish too themselves? Yeah, they both caught them. That's so rad. How long did yeah, it take them to reel in? Uh, they don't take too long. You know, they make they pull some drag. They make a couple nice runs, but you know, they just take a few minutes to reel in. Yeah, that's awesome. They were but probably that, so soaked. Yeah, they liked it. That's the uh, that's the cool thing about redfish is pound for pound, they're probably the hardest fighters in the backwater. I want to go do that. That sounds awesome. It's fun. I've seen those. Uh, because you're talking a foot or two foot deep. I mean, the draft of your boat's got to be pretty, pretty low or pretty high up in the water. I've seen a lot of like those. They're almost like a stand up paddle board with a motor on the back. Have you ever seen those with the push poles on the front and stuff? I've seen a lot of paddle boards and I've seen guys paddle and fish off of them, but I don't think I've seen one with a motor on it. Yeah, I saw one on YouTube. I've been so into the YouTube grind. I've been watching all the salt life videos and stuff and just getting all frothed up to go fishing. But I saw a video the other day and this guy had, it was literally like a paddle board, but it had a seat on it and it had a motor on the back and I was tripping out. I swear it was in like North Carolina or South Carolina. You could do some damage with a setup like that, I bet. Oh my gosh. He was slaying it. He was slaying it. It was so rad. Um, yeah, it was insane. Are there a lot of guys that spearfish over there? There's some offshore spearfishing, but, um, I'd say compared to other areas like South Florida or, or places where you really think that they've got a lot of guys doing it and yeah. people out, it's just not as, not quite as popular here. I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of people doing it, but it's not something that most of my buddies are interested in or do. Yeah. What was the, what was the biggest highlight of that charter? Probably just being able to catch fish without a trolling motor. I mean, <laughs> going into go, fishing marsh flats with no trolling motor like you know if you woke up in the morning and you knew it was broke you wouldn't go back in the old days those guys used to fish with anchors and drift in the with the wind and current and things like that but the the younger crowd's not cut out for that those guys are built different <laughs> all right it's funny so when you're in that shallow of water are you trimming your motor all the way up like are you bringing your motor up on the back yeah i'm i've got it cut off and trimmed all the way up and then um, you know, I've got my trolling motor, uh, trimmed up too, and I'm yeah. still smashing that thing into all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's rough on your boat. So you're, you're really having to work, work with the tides and current changes and stuff like that. Look out for sandbars and whatever's underneath. Yeah. Yep. That's crazy. Yep. There's a lot of oyster rocks and things like that. So you have to, uh, really be aware when you're navigating, you need to be familiar with the water and where you're going. Cause a lot of places where, I'm fishing, I'm running through a couple miles of just a few feet of water to get there. No way. So I'm running, I'm running on plane at 50 plus miles an hour and a foot and a half, two foot of water a lot of times. That's so gnarly. You guys should put jet drives on or something. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea. That's epic. You have any fishing trips coming up besides work? 
I don't have anything planned out this year. I, I'm so busy with charters that uh, I can't even think about anything other than that right now. I'm just making it through the summer right now. I'd love to go somewhere and do some fishing this fall, but uh, you know, usually the, the fall season stays pretty jammed up here. That's our best fishing of the year, October, November, December. So should be steady, and then maybe maybe I'll be able to do something in the winter if I'm lucky. Do you guys have a lot of people that come back like routinely and just come fish with you? We do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been fortunate to uh, already earn the repeat business of a lot of people just in the short amount of time I've been doing this. Uh, awesome. There's a lot of people that might have a vacation house in the area or get a referral from a friend or guys that come in from some of the local cities and, you know, when they get some vacation time and they like to go fish for a couple of days and yeah, so we get a lot of return customers. That's rad. That's good. So for somebody that wants to come to a charter, um, I feel like what you just said is so correct. Like trolling offshore is so boring. Flying kites for tuna is the most boring thing in the world. Like unless you see foamers of tuna and your cast and irons in the water and poppers and stuff, it's a different story. But with near shore and inshore fishing, from my experience of fishing rivers and fishing close to shore, you're able to actually use the tackle at all times, right? I mean, you're you're working to get those fish, and when you get those fish on, it's rewarding, right? When you yes, and when when you've got somebody, even though you know they're a customer and you're the one taking them to the fish, um, they're doing a lot more to earn their fish by casting, catching that fish versus uh, sitting there while you troll them and they pick up the rod and reel the fish in. So I think, I think it feels more hard earned for them too. And they're learning, right? I mean, for the, do you, do you have a lot of customers that have like barely fished at all and they come to a, a charter? Yeah. I'd say over half the people I take out are, are pretty green and don't know a whole lot. And I think they all walk away learning a lot. I mean, I, I always learn something every day. And so yeah. I know they do. Yeah. That to me, that's like the coolest part because you get to give back to the community, right? And like teach these people stuff and they maybe have never casted a rod in their whole entire life. And you're just like, Hey, this is how you do it. We're going to use this for this fish and look at the watercolor. This is the lure we're going to use or the bait we're going to use, whatever. And like those little things click with people, right? And they go with them for the rest of their lives. So that's, what's cool about specifically for you running a charter. I mean, that's yeah. crazy. It's very rewarding to see somebody progress and especially kids just seeing how excited they get when they're able to figure it out and uh you know they're grinding for that bite for a little while and i think they start doubting what's going on and then next thing you know they've got a nice fish on and you can you can see the excitement all over their face yeah so dude this is super awesome i love talking about um the experiences that salt life gets to go and do with charter businesses because the whole podcast is the charter series and um i'm actually going on one in next month and i'm excited to go do it it's going to be close to home like an hour away and we're going to go for some offshore fishing and then i'm going to do a podcast on that i wish i was able to come to every single one of these and be experiencing that because it would be more fun to be able to like like talk to you about these stories and live in that moment and then come talk to you but it's so fun for me to talk to you guys about this stuff because i'm learning a lot about different types of fishing in different types of places and the stories that people get to tell. And that's what fishing is all about, right? We get to talk about stories and bring fishing to other people. That's right. I love yeah, it. you'll have to tag along sometime. Um, I think I've got the Salt Life crew back here uh, in early October for a few days. And uh, always looking forward to that. It's a fun group. Awesome. That's going to be awesome. I love that. Salt Life's always a fun crew to hang out with. They're good. That's right. So do you, do you guys have social media? Uh, Chase and Tails Outdoors is the uh, primary social media for the uh, uh, charter company I work for. And then I've got my own account too, but it's, you know, I seldom will use it. I'm not big into social, social media, media posts or I don't, I've just, I don't know. I know yeah. it's important now and it can, it can help you gain some traction, but I don't, I've just never really taken to it or. That's what makes you a good social person, right? That's right. You get to actually talk to people in real life. That's good. That's right. <laughs> I don't have anything against it. I just haven't put any effort into building it up. But oh, yeah, I've got, I, I've got a, I've got an Instagram account. It's Captain Hunter Bolton. Nice. I love it. Well, everybody, go follow that. And uh, Hunter, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Great talking to you. Great talking to you too. We'll catch you guys next time on Above and Below a Salt Life Podcast. Thanks, Hunter. Have a great day. Yeah.